Welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast. We are presented by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks, Brendan Glasheen, joined today by B.J. Cunningham, Tanner McGrath, Tuesday, May 28th, Best Bets. You can hear Best Bets episodes during the baseball season, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Friday mornings. So subscribe to the podcast if you have not done so already. And you can find us, uh, of course, wherever you listen, audio version, and the Action Network YouTube page. If you are watching today, I look like I've been abducted. I am in a basement. Uh, everything's fine. There is light at the end of the tunnel. So just getting that clear in the air there, because BJ was really concerned when I got into. Well, I mean, you look like you're in a hostage video. I mean, I mean, how if the yeah. people that are watching the YouTube will 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 get what I'm saying here? I mean, it's true. Going from a well lit office space, a couple decorations to to this is a drastic changing of the guard this at least you have a little bit of light on youtube yeah at least you have a little bit of light you know most people that are in these type of situations don't even get to see sunlight at least you have a little bit of light i mean i'm not gonna lie when i was getting re- just a quick aside i have this like uh plastic it, it looks like i was ready to be uh the riddler you know like i have my little kit with my camera and duck i got duct tape here like it, it is pretty dark what i got going on here so um hopefully that leads to a great day of baseball chatter <laughs> um, if you haven't heard, uh, we've switched our record times, usually the night before, but we're actually doing this the morning of Tuesday, May 28th, because of the holiday. So we got ourselves together. Here we are, full 15-game slate. I think we've got a, a, a Mets, um, the Mets play an afternoon game because of a rainout this weekend. Is that right? Mets-Dodgers, right, is today? Yep. yep. 410. Okay, very good. So we got that going on, too. Uh, let's start with best bets and make our way through the slate. BJ, what do you got for a best bet? I'm going to go with the Yankees for the first five innings at minus 165. Nestor Cortez has been incredible this season. 2.85 expected ERA. And he's doing it primarily with just a fastball and a cutter. His fastball, while it doesn't have a lot of velocity, because he only averages about a little over 92 miles per hour on it, it has 18.7 inches of induced vertical break, which allows him to get on top of a lot of hitters. It allows him to induce a lot high number of fly balls. His fastball alone is inducing a 56% fly ball rate. And then he utilizes his cutter that, again, doesn't have much velocity, only averages about 86 miles per hour on it. But, again, he's throwing it quite often up in the zone. It's only allowing a 281 expected weight on base average. It has a stuff plus rating of 107. So it's a very, very difficult pitch to hit. And if you look just from plain actual numbers, the Angels have the third best weighted on base average in baseball uh, against left-handed pitching. But they're around league average, only at about a 300 expected weight on base average on fastballs and cutters up in the zone. So that's primarily where Nestor Cortez is going to live here. So it should be a pretty good matchup for him. The flip side, Griffin Canning has been terrible. He's got an expected ERA over five. His fastball is getting completely lit up, allowing over a 400 expected weight on base average. It only has a stuff plus rating of 67. It's a really, really bad fastball against a team that not only drills fastballs, but his other main pitch of slider, which is the one pitch that grades out above average by stuff plus, the Yankees have the best expected weighted on base average in baseball against right-handed sliders at 333. So, you know, in the last time I was on this podcast, I mentioned this about the Yankees bullpen, which is below average when you look at XFIP, pitching plus, strikeout minus walk rate. So I'd rather not deal with them tonight, and I'd rather target the, the Yankees just for the first five innings, project them over minus 200 here. So I like them at minus 165. Yeah, the Yankees' right. bullpen is probably one of the more overvalued units in baseball. Mm-hmm. But their offense against right-handed pitching, it's the best it, by far. I think their um, WRC Plus is like 10 points higher than any other lineup over the past month against the side. They've been really good. Uh, Yankees coming off the off day. They didn't play yesterday. They only had two runs uh, Sunday. So this is a kind of a good bounce back, too, for that lineup. But a good day to open the series against San Diego. But uh, – they can stretch out Cortez, or they can go to the bullpen early. Um, so we'll see how that goes. He only went five innings in his last start. Tanner, what do you got uh, for a best bet today? I am also going to take a first five money line. I'm going to be with, on the Cincinnati Reds. I would bet this to about minus 130. Uh, I would bet the full game money line, too, because I love Cincinnati's bullpen. But that unit is a tad extended over the past three or four days. I think they're top four four highest leverage relievers have all pitched twice in the past three days. So instead I'll just target starting pitcher, Andrew Abbott, who I talked about last week um, on my weekly appearance on this pod. Uh, He doesn't have 
stuff. He doesn't have good stuff numbers. He doesn't strike out many guys, but he's a fastball changeup pitch to contact guy. And the stuff and the advanced pitching model metrics, they don't know how to accurately quantify change up heavy southpaws. And he is pitching two contact better than pretty much any soft tossing lefty in the league right now. He is forcing a ton of weak contact. It may all be fly ball contact, but it's all weak. Uh, you know, 30% hard hit rate. That's like 92nd percentile or something. He's allowed only two barrels over his past four starts. And so the results are there, you know, sub three expected ERA. Uh, he's allowed more than two earned runs in a start only once in 10 tries. And, you know, nobody can touch the changeup. I mean, a 130 expected batting average allowed 33% whiff rate. It's good stuff. Um, Cardinals offense, their, his opponent today, has they've been trending up, but it's mostly been against right-handed pitching. Uh, they're fourth in WRC plus against righties over the past month, 120 mark, 28th against lefties with a 70. And a lot of their issues stem from a poor batted ball profile. Uh, they don't pull balls. They don't hit them in the air. They're 25th in weighted fastball runs created. They have posted a 4% barrel rate against southpaw fastball changeup mixes, which is dead last in baseball. And now you're going up against the one lefty baseball fastball changeup guy that doesn't allow barrels. The Reds offense is similarly poor, um, but I hope that they can scrape together some run support against Kyle Gibson, the Cardinals starter today, who is now 36, 36 years old. And I think his arm is pretty much toast. Um, his velocity is basically down to a career low. His stuff indicators are down to a career low. So he's nibbling around the edges more. His strikeout minus walk rate is down to a career low. And his expected ERA is up to a career high. It's north of five and a half. And he's been rather lucky so far. I think his ERA is closer to like 3.8. So I, I think that just means he's an overvalued negative regression candidate. Um, I love the Reds today, but we'll be sticking with the first half because of bullpen usage problems. Okay, very good. Let's go to uh, our Fade the Public segment. It's a good one, interesting one. We've got the Tigers and the Pirates tonight in Detroit. Jared Jones on the mound for Pittsburgh. Tarek Skubal for the Tigers. It's a good pitching matchup. The strikeout to walk rates are excellent uh, for both of these guys. Two young up-and-coming arms. The public likes Detroit. Um, 82% of the bets, 72% of the cash on Scoobal and the Tigers over Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh on the money line, plus 135, BJ. Any interest in fading the public and taking Mr. Jones? You know, the number's getting a little high here on Scoobal, in my opinion. Um, you know, Jones has, has had three starts that haven't really gone well. Um, he's given up three straight runs, two against the Cubs. Um, but if you look at the X fifth from those starts, you know, one was only a 2.6. The other one was a 4.6. He basically had like two bad starts. And now it seems like the public is kind of jumping on him and saying, okay, hang on. Maybe he's not that good. He still leads major league baseball and stuff plus by a pretty wide margin. I might mention, and same thing with pitching plus um, and the matchup here against the Tigers offense. Now on the surface level, the Tigers do have a, a 100 WRC plus against right-handed pitching, but you dig into the two pitches that they're going to face from Jones, which is mainly his fastball and his slider against Right-handed fastballs that are that are uh, faster than 96 miles per hour, uh, the Tigers are in the bottom 10 of Major League Baseball in terms of expected weighted on base average. Um, same thing, bottom half of Major League Baseball against right-handed sliders as well. So they don't hit those two pitches particularly well. Uh, the flip side of the coin is, is that the Pirates have been a lot better against left-handed pitching than they have against righties. Um, when you dig into the pitches specifically, they're around league average against fastballs and changeups, which are Scoobles' main two pitches. But they do crush sinkers, which is Scoobles' main third pitch. They throws around 22% of the time. They actually are 403 expected weight on base average against that pitch. So um, looking at this, you know, I projected the Tigers at minus 127, which I thought was a, a fair line considering both of these offense offenses aren't really that good. And I don't think you can really split much of a difference between these two tar- two starting pitchers in terms of talent and stuff, quite frankly. So, um, you know, I was looking at the first five under it's dropped down to under three and a half at, at minus minus one twenty. That's far too low, uh, to play here. But I mean, the pirates are at, you know, getting up here now to, uh, plus one thirty five. If they get up to plus one forty, I might have to end up playing them. Um, just because Jones is still a really good pitcher just because he's had a couple of bad starts. I think the, the, 
the public is now just jumping all jumping against him because of those bad starts. Tanner, what say you? Yeah, I think I like the Pirates here. I actually think I like the Pirates a lot, um, and a couple reasons why. Look, Scooble, um, he got hit really hard by the Royals in his last start, and I was I was super excited for that pitching matchup. That was Reagans versus Scooble, and I was super disappointed to see Scooble basically just get whipped around by the Royals. I mean, he allowed three barrels in a start for only his second time this year. The Royals, they pulled 43% of their batted balls, and they actually had more line drives and fly balls than they had ground balls. They hit eight balls in the air and only six on the ground. Scooble's fastball velocity was down just a tick. And look, he's still the rightful AL Cy Young favorite. He's still the best pitcher in the league. I've thought this since the preseason, actually. Um, But, you know, even the best pitchers can be due for a bit of regression. And I was just concerned about what I saw with him against the Royals where his stuff wasn't cruising past batters like it usually does. I mean, he got hit really hard. And uh, BJ talked about it. The Pirates are in their much better split because, as he mentioned, they're above average offense against lefties, but a near league worse against righties. And look, they could, they're could they projected to have eight righties in the lineup today, which is a big thing against a left-handed pitcher. And, you know, Scooble, not totally immune to platoon splits. I mean, his WOBA allowed this year is about 40 points higher against the right side than it is against the left. Um, we know, as BJ said, we know Jared Jones is an elite stuff guy. Uh, the problem with him usually is that he's a hard throwing, hard contact guy, like a Spencer Strider. So he can get in trouble, can give up a lot of hard hit balls, some home runs, but the Tigers lineup, not even from a pitch specific perspective, but just overall, it's not a hard hitting one. I mean, you know, a 35% hard hit rate against ready over the past two weeks, that added up to a, it's a 250 expected WOBA against the side over that time, that stretch. Fourth worst among MLB lineups. And I think they're a little bit overvalued or due for regression or due for just a, a poor performance after they just ripped on Toronto's pitching staff over the weekend. I mean, they dropped 22 runs in a three-game series. They won that third game 14 to 11. Uh, also... They tire, I think they tired out their bullpen a bit. Uh, Jason Foley pitched in three straight games between Friday and Sunday. The Pirates' bullpen, really well-rested. Um, and it's arguably the better unit, although it's it's pretty close. So, yeah, plus 135. I, I think I'm going to take the Pirates to fade the public, uh, buy, sell high a bit on Reagan, on Scooble, and um, just uh, also sell high on the Tigers' lineup. Okay, very good. Yeah, the um, our Action Pro tool is identifying big money coming in on Pittsburgh, but the majority of the bets and the uh, and the cash coming in on on the Tigers today. So there's basically an underdog that you guys like the uh, Tigers with Jared Jones today. What about another underdog for the slate, BJ? Uh, how about the Rockies plus one twenty five for the first five innings against the Guardians? Uh, I mean, the Guardians are the hottest team in baseball. They just seem like can't lose. Um, and really what it comes down to is the fact that they're an elite defensive team and elite, and they have an elite bullpen. Like their bullpen is like miles better than second place. If you look at XFIP, um, but we have Tristan McKenzie on the mound who has struggled this season, specifically with the command of his fastball, uh, four fifty four expected weight on base average allowed on his fastball this season, um, over, a, over a five walk per nine rate. Um, and he is a little bit of a, a negative aggression candidate as well. His, his uh, expected ERA is a run and a half higher than his actual ERA, up at 4.76. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Rockies lineup is is good or whatever, but uh, against right-handed pitching, they've been closer to league average than the bottom, so it's not inherently terrible. Um, and Ryan Feltner's been a really good starting pitcher this season. Like He's got an above-average stuff plus numbers. He's been very good with the command over his entire arsenal. Um, and the Guardians lineup, quite frankly, is, uh, you know, overperforming quite a bit. So um, I think that the the number here is just the fact that the Guardians are hot, they have an elite bullpen, and that's what people are dr- drawn towards. But again, I like the first five, not the full game, because um, like I said, Guardians have the best at bullpen, and let's just say the Rockies have the worst. So um, I would prefer not to deal with the, the bullpen matchup here. So Rockies, first five, plus 125. The Fair Rockies enough. have been hot, man. They, they're, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, they had that nine-game winning streak. Now they've won, I think it's like 
four of their past six. They're 12 and 11 as a home underdog this year. They're, yep. They are a frisky, frisky team. They, and Chris Bryant's back I can't back really put injury. it together why, but they, they're just frisky. They're fun to watch. Yeah. Horrible on the road, but we yeah, care about yeah, that's where, This game's in Coors, though. Yep. Coor, the, the Coors uh, variability factor always plays. And, and I will say the wind's blowing out. Tristan McKenzie has had a home run problem uh, mainly his entire career. This season of almost a 13% home run to fly ball rate. So could see some balls go out for the Rockies. Okay. All right. Underdog for you, Tanner. All right. Let's talk about my beloved fish. I'm taking the Miami Marlins on the money line. If, if you follow me on Twitter, at Tanner's Truth, you know my affinity for betting on and losing on the Miami Marlins. And it's been a rather tough year for all of my agendas. But the fish are finally turning things around. They're swimming downstream again. And it's mainly been on the mound. Um, I, I have discussed on the podcast before how I've always thought the, the Miami's bullpen was super undervalued. Uh, still think that. Uh, you know, Andrew Nardi was underperforming. AJ Pook needed to be in the closer setup role. He was never going to be a starter. Tanner Scott is still really good. Declan Cronin and uh, Brian Hoeing have started to emerge as reliable middle relievers. The Fish now rank ninth among MLB uh, relief corps in bullpen stuff plus 107. And that unit has really turned the ship around. They've snuck up to 12th among MLB um, bullpens in war. They posted a 2.4 ERA over the past two weeks. And, you know, we projected them as like a borderline top 10 unit in the preseason. And I think that this, um, how they're performing is closer to their true talent level than whatever that disaster was in April. Also, uh, something happened with Jesus Lazardo, starting pitcher today. Yep. I was really worried about him in the early season because a lot of his indicators were pointing downwards. Uh, stuff, location, strikeout minus walk rate specifically. But I think he might have been hurt because he took some time off at the end of April. I think he hit the IL. Then he just made a dominant rehab start at single-A Jupiter and since has been totally shut down. In his last three starts, Phillies, Mets, Brewers, by the way, three good offenses. Two earned runs in 20 innings. Both came against Philly. 19 strikeouts, uh, 12 hits, and a walk. 50 whiffs. 50 whiffs. 21 came on his ever-dangerous slider. 20 on his worm-burning changeup. His velocity is actually down a tad, but he's not, he's locating much better than he did in the early season. He's making fewer mistakes, and he's forcing more weak contact. Um, you know, he's allowed only two barrels in his past three starts on like a 20% hard contact rate. And that should play against the Padres, who are a very pesky contact-based lineup, which has worked for them, you know, especially since the Luis Arias trade. But they don't hit the ball hard, especially against lefties. Uh, over the past month and against southpaws, they have an 85 WRC+, plus, that's 20th among MLB lineups, a 24% hard contact rate, that's 28th, and a 35% pull rate, that's 27th. And, you know, Lizardo went into San Diego last year, you know, Peco, a noted pitcher's park, and tossed six innings of shutout ball, with seven strikeouts while allowing only three base runners, two hits and a walk. Uh, the, pa the pads will start Mike Waldron. Uh, I, I don't know how, how good he really is. Uh, so he's the first knuckleball pitcher that we've had in a few years, and he's very reliant on the knuckleball. because uh, And otherwise, you know, he has a very pedestrian arsenal. Uh, he sits 91 on his fastball, which he is throwing more now as a, a knuckleball complement rather than a sinker which I don't know if that's a good thing in the long run, even though the short-term results have been a little bit better. Uh, he has an 83 stuff plus rating across his arsenal, and he walks a good amount of batters, like 9%. Uh, the Padres bullpen has been red hot, but they're also a tad extended. Uh, their closer, Robert Suarez, who has been awesome this season, has pitched four times in the past six days. So my hope is that the my beloved fish can scrape together something against uh, nine innings of pitching in Petco and then dominated the mound again because, you know, the fish have won eight of their last 12 by tossing five shutouts during the stretch. So go fish. Give me them and anything. I'm targeting plus 110 or better. Lazardo's got two of those shutouts. Uh, like you had said, he had the mild flexor muscle strain in his throwing elbow. Yep, yep, yeah. Thanks. Didn't, didn't throw the ball for three days. Said he felt good after, like nothing happened and – the results have uh, been good in his three starts since coming back. Yeah, he must have been hurting up on the mound in the early season because he came back and now he just looks like the 
the the Lizardo of old since he really came over from Oakland. He's been yep. great. So okay, there we go. We got the Rockies and the Marlins for the underdog segment today, and uh, we'll do some final bets. BJ is going to hit the. Uh, he's going to dabble in the strikeout prop market. Yeah. Uh, first one, Ben Brown under five and a half strikeouts, minus one ten against the Brewers. So Ben Brown has spent time both in the starting rotation and in the bullpen for the Cubs. And there is a pretty distinct difference between his performances in the bullpen versus in the starting rotation. In the starting rotation, his strikeout rate is at 9.3, which is actually pretty good. But when he's in the bullpen, it's at 11.5. So, um, and if you look through all the game logs of essentially the times that he has started, there's only been two of his five starts where he's faced more than 20 batters. So, if we take his strikeout rate, which is projected to be about 25% based on what he has as a starter, times even 21 batters, that only gets us to about 5.2. So you take the Brewers lineup as well. That is a very good fastball hitting lineup where Ben Brown is throwing his fastball 61% of the time. It's not particularly the best matchup, and I don't think you're going to see him go past five innings here. And if he does, he'll be pitching a great game. But from a strikeout perspective, Five and a half is too high on a guy who is barely going to make it five innings. And then Mike Clevenger under four and a half strikeouts. Um, I could run through a bunch of stats about Mike Clevenger right now, but he's been terrible. Like there's really just no other way to describe it. He's been really bad. Expected area is over six now, but from a strikeout perspective, it's way down. He's not getting many swings and misses. He's facing a Blue Jays lineup that has bottom, that has the fifth best uh, strikeout rate against right-handed pitching. They just don't strike out against righties. So I don't know how he's getting to five strikeouts unless it's some kind of miracle. I don't even know if he's going to get to five innings here. I mean, he's, he's only in his four starts, he's thrown 16 innings and he's like barely facing 20 batters. So it's a very limited uh, number of batters to actually get to over, to get to five strikeouts. So uh, two strikeout props for me, Ben Brown under and Clevenger under. This is a good um, plug here. Um, Our action labs, uh, subscription gives us uh yep. they gives us daily um pitcher prop projections ben brown uh represents the highest edge today on his under they project him for only 4.1 strikeouts uh compared to 5.5 in the market and then you've got clevenger at only f- four flat so i think the you know by our advanced uh nerd metrics these are two really good plays excellent and then to take us home tanner two more first five sides yeah, let's uh, run through it. Uh, I will be on the Baltimore Orioles first five money line minus 170 or better. I wrote this big long piece, uh, which you guys have mentioned on the pod before about uh, for pitcher list about Boston's pitching developments this season behind the wizardry of coaches Andrew Bailey, Justin Willard, and the run prevention unit. Brian Bayo seems to be the only one who has not taken major leaps and strides. He seems stuck, which is really frustrating to us Red Sox fans. Actually, all three of us here are Sox fans, aren't we? So we all can um, you know empathize with me on the fact that Bayo just can't seem to take the next step. Um, I think he's pushing the right buttons. He's stopped throwing four seamers. He's leaned into more change-up sinkers, which is really the baseline for all of his prior success because that's where he's always forced his unique combination of ground balls and whiffs. But he's struggling with his command. Uh, on his sinker, he's leaving everything up m- more up in the zone and middle-middle as opposed to down. And hitters are able to elevate it and hit it hard. His batted ball profile is messy, and they're whiffing even less than normal on a sinker. I mean, 13% rate on high location sinkers. He's also struggling with walks. Um, you know, he issued four free passes against the Rays because he's not generating as many strikes with his changeup. The swinging strike rate on that pitch is down like three or four points. He might even be a negative regression candidate too, because he's got a brutally low 240 Babbitt, which definitely has to regress given he's a ground ball pitcher. Uh, with a terrible defense behind him with a brutal middle infield duo. His expected ERA is up around 4.3. And I do think he could turn this thing around with better command. I just don't love what I'm seeing right now. And he's pitched fine against Baltimore in three career appearances, but not great. Uh, 4.02 ERA, six walks and 15 innings. Baltimore has a 350 expected Woba against right-handed sinker changeup mixes. And, you know, the O's, they're always going to mash. They have the offensive advantage against most teams. And Bayo has pretty severe platoon splits. Uh, his career XFIP 
is more than a run higher against southpaws and against righties. And the O's will have, they should have three left-handed bats at the top of the order in Henderson, Rutschman, and O'Hearn, not to mention Kowser and Mullins toward the back. So I don't love this matchup. Meanwhile, Grayson Rodriguez, Baltimore starting pitcher today, pitching pretty well since returning from the IL. Uh, he has a 118 stuff plus mark on the year. I think that's ninth among uh, starting pitchers with however many innings. Shaky command at times. But the Red Sox are not the most disciplined team against right-handed pitching. Uh, 24% strikeout rate, 7% walk rate, 13% swinging strike rate, 80% zone contact rate against the side. Those are all below average indicators. And they have lefties in the lineup. But Grayson's actually been pretty good against lefties this year. Uh, Grayson has only two career starts against Boston, 10 innings, two earned runs in both starts, 11 strikeouts to four walks. But I'll take my chances with the O's first five and anything better than minus 170 because I believe Baltimore has the better offense, better starting pitcher. I'm very worried about Bayo, and the Red Sox will be at a defensive disadvantage against pretty much any team. Um, I'm iffy on the bullpen matchups because the O's are just a tad extended back back there, so I am going to stick with Baltimore in the first half. I also really like the Royals' first five um, because of one Garrett Cole Hamels Reagans, one of our favorite guys on this podcast, the budding superstar with a 115 stuff plus fastball and a 140 stuff plus slider and an elite changeup with a 25% swinging strike rate that just does not get enough love. His fastball still checks in, in the upper 90s. He's got mo- good movement and tunneling on all three pitches. So he's striking out 30% of batters. And I mean, he just dominated the A's and Tigers in his past two starts. Uh, 30 combined whiffs, 18 came on his four seam. And he just totally out-dueled uh, Scooble. Just looked like the true AL Cy Young. Now he's facing a Twins lineup that I think is slumping a tad, especially against the left side. Uh, 94 WRC plus over the past two weeks against that side. Not remaining disciplined. They're chasing a lot of pitches. And, you know, Reagan's in his opening day start this year against the Twins uh, struck out nine of them on a lot of chases. Uh, allowed two earned runs over six innings. Meanwhile, I don't know if Minnesota's starting pitcher Simeon Woods Richardson is any good. Uh, you know, 74 stuff plus mark on his heavily used four seam fastball. And he's, it, it, it just doesn't have much velo or ride and he's getting hit pretty hard, you know, 86 stuff plus rating. And he throws a lot of stuff in the zone and he just gets barreled away. Uh, the Royals are really hitting righties hard lately. Uh, pull rate near 50%, hard hit rate over 40%, low ground ball rate and a high fly ball rate. This is all over the past month or so. Resulted in an expected WOBA over 350 against the side over the past three weeks. That's tops in Major League Baseball. Richardson, at the minimum, is a negative regression candidate because his 2.5 ERA is paired with a 3.7 expected ERA and a 4.4 expected FIP. So, yeah, he has great command, but I don't think he can sustain his ERA behind a mediocre fastball-heavy zone approach. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, look, I'm pretty happy to bet on Reagans almost always. And I think the Royals have a slight offensive edge against a negative regression candidate. And unfortunately, there's no way I'm going to take the Royals full game because as us three have mentioned here at least two or three times, the Royals bullpen is just a fade candidate for the foreseeable, for the foreseeable future. Excuse me. So I'm just not interested in the full game, but I do really like Royals first five. Uh, anything better than, I don't know, plus 130 probably. Beauty. I mean, I was actually kind of wondering, would we get to Garrett Cole Hamels Reagans in this episode? Our guy, we have to. You've added the Garrett though. You're, you're more you're more firm on the Garrett part now. I'm trying to find more Garrett. names I can add in there. Maybe maybe Garrett Cole Hamels Ronald Reagans, something like that. I don't know. We'll work on it. <laughs> See how it goes. But yeah, he's having a good year. All right, gents. That, that, I think that's it. Very good. Uh, we're, we're off and running. Another week of payoff pitch here as we uh, enter we're through Memorial Day. And we're, we're hitting June. And now the next milestone is the, the All-Star break to see who's going to be in this thing. So don't forget to download the free award-winning Action Network app to find guys like BJ and Tanner. Uh, you can find their picks uh, for uh, baseball today and uh, future slates. And also, when it comes to the podcast, please leave a five-star rating and review. Uh, We'll do some giveaways again uh, in June. So, chance to win some action swag or a free one-year subscription to Action Pro. Also, check out the Action Network Discord. There is a link 
uh, to the episode or the link to the uh, channel in the episode description. Payoff pitch uh, comes your way again. We'll be back here Friday. We'll, we'll have a podcast out Friday morning. We'll record Thursday night. So thanks for tuning in. For BJ and Tanner, Brendan Glasheen, thanks for listening to Payoff Pitch, Action Network's MLB betting podcast presented by BetMGM.